Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Megan Jones from ICEA. Welcome you to, an, to the first collaborative webinar between the ICEA Southern California chapter and the Machine Learning Working Group. Today's webinar is gonna count as 90 minutes of training towards your CCEA certification. So those of you who are keeping track, keep your confirmation in your records for when your renewal is due. I would like to hand it over to Karen Marikas, the president of the ICS Southern California chapter and the wheel, if you will, of the Machine Learning Steering Committee. Karen? Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Megan, are you sharing any charts yet? I see a black screen. According to what I'm seeing, I see a machine learning in space. All right, let's see. Is Senator, that just... anyone else confirm for us, please? I see that as well. Okay. Okay, so it's just me. Great. <laughs> All right, well, I have the slide, so I can go along with that. <laughs> um, here, I'll turn my camera on and uh, then uh, I'd say, hi, everybody. Okay. So, as I was saying, um, you know, good morning, good afternoon. Um, so, a little bit about the Southern California chapter. Typically, we do full day um, in person workshops about three or four times a year, but obviously, we can't do that right now. So, we are switching to a webinar format for at least for the time being. And our theme today has to do with both machine learning and space. Um, so the theme in quotes there, machine learning in space with all those extra A's um, is sort of a play on words and, and we'll go into that a little bit more um, in a minute. Um, but if you go to the agenda slide, Megan. And this is what we're going to be covering today. Um, so we'll, we'll do a couple of like introductions, announcements and things. Then we'll get into our program. We've got two speakers who are speaking about something about space systems and cost analysis. Uh, and then one of those is also incorporating machine learning. And then we'll also hear from the machine learning um, working group. Um, and then we'll go into our interactive portion of the meeting. Uh, if you've ever used Poll EV, that's what we're going to be using. We will be sending out the link via the chat window so everyone will have it. Um, and it's a lot of fun. You get to see immediate feedback. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do our recognition and closing. So next slide. And very quickly, this is our new chapter board. We were The elections were held at the end of last year, so we all started at the beginning of this year. Uh, I'm not going to go through and introduce everyone, but I did want you to see who everyone is, what, what we all look like, because we're not in person. Um, and you will get a chance to hear from many of these people uh, today as we're going through the program. All right, next slide. All right, so we're starting with the trivia question, and there's going to be a prize for this. So I, I said a little bit er, earlier about, you know, machine learning in space. It's a sort of a play on word. Um, you'll notice that there are some extra A's in the word space. That's not a typo. Um, and the idea for this theme is that, well, first of all, we've got some presentations that deal with machine learning and we've got presentations that deal with space. We're not actually talking about performing machine learning in space, at least not yet. Maybe that'll come. Um, but we were trying to come up with a kind of a cute uh, title or theme for this webinar. So if you happen to know where the sort where the concept of this idea came from, or, or the, the reference for this idea came from, um, type it in the chat window. Only Megan will see your responses. Um, and we will be checking periodically throughout the meeting to see if anyone has come up with the right answer. And one thing that may help you come up with the right answer is if you say it uh, phonetically. So I will do that for you right now. Uh, machine learning in space. So if that helps ring a bell, um, <laughs> uh, go ahead and type your answer in the chat window. Uh, and we, like I said, we will be checking periodically to see if anyone comes up with the right answer. 
All right, let's see, next slide. Um, so Lisa is going to talk to us. So this is um, Dr. Lisa Colabella, and she is one of our newest members to ICEA and to the board. Um, and she's from the RAND company. And so she'll be talking to us a little bit about what our chapter is planning on doing this year. So that'll cover the next two slides. So Lisa, if you are unmuted or, or if you're muted, unmute yourself. Oh, can everybody see me okay? My background is not as nice as Karen's, but <laughs> it's great to see you all. Um, as Karen mentioned, these are our priorities that we've been outlining on the, the board meetings we have. We have two meetings and we've been talking about what we want to, what our priorities are. And our main ones are uh, growth, uh, profession, professional development, and networking. So toward that end, we've been planning and taking steps to achieve certain activities. Uh, we've been getting in touch with our contacts that we have in academia uh, and industry and uh, trying to invite them to do webinars uh, and, and uh, present work in progress. Um, we're also planning to promote uh, ICEA via various professional societies and job fairs. Um, we're all uh, looking forward to the, there's an upcoming uh, Naval Post Graduate School Annual Acquisition Research Symposium, which is one of those opportunities. Um, we've talked about uh, and, and taking steps towards, towards um, professional development activities, in particular training. And uh, the next slide that we go to, we'll discuss some of the training activities that we are uh, coordinating. Uh, we also have some plans in mind for after the pandemic, uh, which we think will be a lot of fun, you know, having, arranging some local breakfast, lunch, after work meetings, uh, workshops. Uh, you know, we can all get to see each other face to face again. That'll be really nice. And hopefully we're getting closer towards that. Uh, and uh, we've been looking into also local service projects. And we invite you all, if there are ideas you have for service projects may be appropriate. Uh, one of the things we were talking about is, you know, reaching out to students, at, uh, that are university students, even uh, high school students to get them familiar with, with um, cost-related fields. We contact the Youth Motivation Task Force. And uh, so we want uh, opportunities that uh, come up like that. And, and if any of you have suggestions about ways that we can uh, reach out and bring people more into the fold of the Southern California chapter by ICEA and, uh, and get people more interested in the cost field, uh, we welcome them. We'd love your input. So we can go to the next slide and talk about some of the topics we're going to in uh, <clears throat> training. Some of the uh, training topics that we've talked about are listed here. In particular, uh, the main ones I've heard mentioned a lot are the design to cost and the estimated completion topic. So we're looking forward to putting together some uh, training on that, bringing together, uh, we have a nice group of experts in the, in the chapter and, and, and beyond the chapter, and we look forward to putting together some of these presentations for you. And, uh, and as mentioned before, any suggestions of, of topics that you think are of interest, please feel free to contact us and let us know if there's particular training topics that you think will be valuable to you and your work and to others that are coming up. And that's about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And I would also like to make one point that if you would like to help us put together some of these um, training classes, then you know, please let us know. Uh, we're always looking for more volunteers. All right, Karen, next. can I just can I make a quick comment on that? You may. With a uh, with a positive report card for their volunteer efforts from the Southern California chapter, um, the international office is more than happy to give you guys recertification points for, for your efforts towards helping out with, with developing training programs. So if anybody needs a, a little reward or a carrot, there's, uh, there's points in it for you. Okay. All right, so on slide seven now, we are starting to move into our program and our first speaker will be introduced by Danny Politi. I see Danny is on, so Danny, you need to unmute yourself if you can. Um, and a little bit about Danny. He has been on the Southern California chapter board for at least four years, maybe longer, I'm not sure. Um, and he's currently not on the board. However, he is running for Region 7 director unopposed, so, you know, he's a shoe in um, But if you haven't voted yet, April 15th is the deadline to vote. Um, so please get your vote in and vote for Danny. Um, so Danny, okay, go ahead. You can introduce Mike. Sure, let me just do a quick sound check. Can you hear me pretty well? Yes. 
Very good. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And it is with great pleasure that I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Mike Finnegan. Mike Finnegan is a cost estimator and applied mathematician working for Boeing Satellite Systems. And his current responsibilities include providing parametric cost estimates for commercial satellites during the proposal process, working as a cost volume lead, updating and maintaining a cost model, and supporting process improvements. And prior to this position, Mike has worked in cost estimation for Boeing test and evaluation, and as a procurement financial analyst for Boeing Defense. His academic background includes a BS in mathematics and Spanish, and an MS in mathematics with a focus in abstract algebra. Now, I also had a note passed to me from one of our board members who tells me, Mike is a young, energetic, and extremely smart guy, so we're very lucky to have him here with us today. And also, he's apparently an avid runner, and he runs multiple marathons a year. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our next guest, Mike Finnegan. Mike? Hello, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, as Danny stated, I am currently working in the commercial satellites area of Boeing Satellite Systems. And I was lucky enough to inherit the Boeing Satellite Systems cost model, otherwise known as the BISCOM, as one of the major projects that I get to work on here. So one of the, the first tasks that I was giving was solving this concept known as acquisition complexity. And I'll get further into that once I back up a little bit and describe to you guys exactly what the cost model is, what we're estimating over here. And um, that'll help lead into this uh, topic of ac acquisition complexity. So satellites 101 here, um, when we're estimating satellites, whether it's commercial or government, the typical process is we have the satellite bus, which is your structure, mechanisms, thermal, harness, propulsion, all that hardware stuff. Then we have the payload module, which is the purpose of the satellite. It's your antennas, it's all your communication electronics. And then sometimes, not every time, we have a host of payloads. So this would be a com secondary communications electronics, not necessarily related to the primary mission, might even be a separate customer altogether, but wanting to tag on to that bus that's headed out into space. So to put this into terms for, you know, like I was two years ago before I came into this group, um, brand new to satellites, no clue what a satellite was, how it worked. Um, the most basic comparison for the satellite system is a car. So the car itself, the physical car, that would be the bus module, the payload, the purpose of the car is to transport, you know, people back and forth. So Payload is um, directly related to what the people of the car would be without the people the car serves no purpose. And uh, for the hosted payload concept, now this is where I disagree with, you know, people coming in through Boeing before me, they related it to additional car load, something that you'd be transporting with you. I think that if the payload are the people of the car, your hosted payload in this analogy would be I don't know, maybe a hitchhiker or cousin Eddie who finds out the family vacations heading down to Florida and wants to tag along on that trip as well. So we get to estimate um, the satellites at all of these levels. And even from the bus and the payload, we dig down deeper into the subsystem level, which would be your communication of electronics, antennas, propulsion and power. And then we can even estimate further down one more level that breaks down the antenna into smaller components and we'll estimate at that level as well. So on the next slide, um, the next fun part about this cost model is we have a wide range of satellites that we're estimating and a lot of these programs that we estimate are one-offs. So the smallest one, which isn't necessarily included in our model would be CINCOM, which is 28 inches wide versus one of our current ongoing programs, the uh, WGS satellite that is as large as a Boeing 737, as far as wingspan is concerned. So we get a wide range of satellites we're estimating, um, and it makes this process even more intricate as far as comparing your bus and your payload. 
um, and how we estimate at each one of those levels. So I'll get into the uh, overview of the BISCM, this uh, Boeing Satellite System Cost Model. Then after that, I'll break down what this Acquisition Complexity Soar, ACS, actually is, how we go about defining that variable, what we do to treat that as a variable in our cost model, and what sort of results we've seen from that. Um, and then we'll get into how we go about using acquisition complexity, which relies on a mathematical technique known as principal components analysis, and show how that relates the variable to the rest of the regression. And then, um, fortunately, I didn't update this slide, but we can't get too much into the last two bullets there, the SIR statistics or the comparison of cost due to proprietary data. So we unfortunately won't get to see that far into this. So the BISCM model and our database overview. So we have about 145 different programs ranging from basic commercial satellites to the most complex government um, satellites, whether it's unclassified or classified into stuff that the peons like me don't even get to know about. We include as many satellites as we can, whether it dates back to 1975 or current ongoing programs. We collect all the costs the same way um, and rebucket those costs consistently across um, all the programs in accordance with the military standard WBS. In this cost model, we maintain over 100 cost estimating relationships. And as I mentioned before, these are not all unique. Um, they're at various levels of the satellite. So we can estimate at the very most top level of a satellite, just satellite as a whole, not occurring versus recurring. We could also break that down into the bus versus the payload as the total costs, break those down further into those subsystems that I mentioned before, structures and mechanisms, thermal, et cetera. And then we could break those down into components. So we have serves at every single level of this satellite. Um, in order to have serves, you have to have technical parameters. So we have collected data across all these programs for over 40 parameters. Um, that obviously not all of these parameters are included in every SIR. The, Part of the process is we go and test as many different parameters per SIR as we can and make sure it makes sense to the subsystem we're estimating. Um, and to do all this, we have a very small team within the Boeing Satellites Cost Estimating Team that is working on this parametric cost model. I think there's maybe five or six of us and our jobs range from updating the SIRs to testing out new variables to improve the statistics and the cost relationships making sure all the programs have been mapped consistently across the years as that WBS format changes, um, making sure it's consistent all the way through. And in the meantime, we also do uh, the cost estimating. So when a proposal kicks off, for example, I'm in charge of the commercial satellites. Um, other members of my team will do the government or the proprietary proposals. So the beauty of that is that we use the model um, to actually come up with a cost estimate. So it helps us know how to improve that cost model for the real life situations we've run into, as well as um, any tweaks that need to change that. It's like, hey, maybe this doesn't work how we thought. Let's get back to the drawing board on that. So the users of this cost model are the ones who are building it. So it's a very good relationship there because it's within ourselves. The downside of that is we don't have as much time to update and maintain the model because we're also doing the cost estimates. So the development environment here, um, before, about two years ago, I, I joined the, key, the team along with Akila Wallace and she and I were handed this cost model where all the database files were in Excel. The SIR development was also in Excel and um, a lot of hard-coded values in there, and we all know Excel is not the most advanced um, statistical package within a software that you can find. Um, so to go through and update 104 SERS and over 140 programs to make sure the data is all the latest, kept up to date, um, it, it was very cumbersome. And so we've been looking for more data science solutions for just general upkeep of the model as well. And then there's another issue I'll get into here later. Um, but we're also we're looking at different softwares that can help us standardize the data sets, keep everything, you know, if it changes in the source data, it'll automatically change in the data that we use to run the regressions. Um, this line I don't 
necessarily think needs to be in here anymore about linking back to Excel, but um, for now we're in this nice little in-between phase where with this principal components analysis that we've used, it's helping us move out of being so reliant on Excel and into um, the future, as we like to call it, or Boeing 2050, as moving into software applications such as R, Python, to house all of our databases and the regression analysis so everything is automated. So now the acquisition complexity problem statement. So the problem is that there are known cost differences at both the unit and system level for commercial and government, whether classified or unclassified, due to execution or programmatic differences. So for every satellite, we've kind of generalized it into two different categories that will affect the overall cost of this satellite. The first one is all of our tangible, quantifiable data through our technical complexity, as we'll call it, and this is addressed through um, size, weight, and power, new design, number of panels, et cetera, all the things that we can absolutely quantify. The issue comes along with the fact that while our cost model includes both government and commercial just due to the size of our data set, 140 programs, it's not necessarily a large amount of data when looking for regressions and trends through the data. But we know that there are clear program differences that will impact the cost, whether we are working with a government customer or a commercial customer. So this is where we define acquisition complexity. And we have defined this into eight different categorical variables, all related to how this program will be executed. And due to the nature of the, um, the business we're in, I can't go into too many details on what those eight cost drivers are, but we've standardized across all 140 programs how we categorize each one of these cost drivers on a score of one through five. And it's um, been consistently done at multiple levels of the spacecraft for each program. So this is where that data science solution comes into play because we need to take these eight categorical variables now and translate those into something that we can utilize in our regression as a standalone variable. The issue with that is um, when it comes to statistics and variables is you can't have too many categorical variables in a model, otherwise it just gets jumbled up and the data is not clearly explained or the variances aren't clearly explained when you have multiple categorical variables. So the solution that we arrived to was principal components analysis. So side note is that this is um, a variable in a sense called acquisition complexity that's consistent with our um, counterparts in the government called uh, commercial acquisition program or CAPS approach. So this is where and this goes back before I joined the team, all of these variables were defined and uh, created in this process was implemented that we need to find a way to not only incorporate into the model, but it needs to be a repeatable process. So when I'm going through and estimating a new satellite, I can use this as a toggle to drive that cost. So the solution that we've ended up with is principal components analysis. Oh, yep, this, oh, bouncing around. There we go. All right, so we landed at principal components analysis. Again, um, we had looked at multiple different methods, just a solver method based, you know, how does how do these eight scores relate to the variance and try to look at acquisition complexity as a sense of after we run our initial regression, then we looked at partial these squares as a potential way to analyze these eight um, cost drivers. The issue with that is it became very hard to replicate from the user end of the cost model and to turn that into something that we can actually use as a variable going forward with estimates instead of just describing what's happened in the past. So we've arrived at using principal components analysis because it not only helps us explain the variance within this data set of these eight cost drivers, but it's also something that we could use in our cost model while we're putting together an estimate. So principal components analysis is a linear combination on the original data set that will help explain the amount of variance within that, own, within that data set, just looking at those eight cost drivers. And it's gonna uncorrelate all the data in there into eight 
the nearly independent um, vectors through the process essentially that it's taking the eigenvectors or eigenvalues of that matrix of data creating eigenvectors that we could then, then take the eigenvector and plug that into our cost model. So it's just a step in principal component regression that we're utilizing here. So what this does is as part of um, my process when I'm going through and updating a SIR, the very first step is I'll take all the programs with that we're going to utilize within that SIR, so structures and mechanisms, for example, and I'll perform principal components analysis on those eight cost drivers first before I look at anything else. And then I'll come up with our principal components one through eight. I'll then take that, that spits us out a score that we could use as an input variable. And then after we go through that, we rerun the SIRS with this component in there now to make sure that it's reacting in the SIR the correct way. So I have a graphic here. I don't think it'll work, but it's essentially describing how principal, com principal components analysis looks through space. Um, so if it doesn't work, I'll just talk to that little picture on the right there. That little horizontal bar will just spin through the data set until it maximizes the amount of variance explained within that data set. And then you can see that uh, vertical line going down. It's kind of light um, in comparison, but it's completely perpendicular to that other line. So you can imagine that long line is going to be principal component one. And then that second line there is principal component two. And that's important that it's perpendicular because that means it will be linearly independent now. So it's going to reduce the multicollinearity within the data set and give us in this case, we have eight cost drivers. So we'll come out of this process with eight linearly independent cost drivers. So ignore the box at the top there. Um, looking at pr principal components analysis there, this is the output. We're currently using Minitab to perform this analysis. And this is um, what we're presented with after we put these eight cost drivers called parameters one through eight first. Uh, data sensitivity reasons. Um, so the first thing it's, this report's telling us is the eight eigenvalues that come out of finding that, um, or taking this matrix of data from your linear algebra days. I'm sure anybody who's taken a uh, linear algebra class will remember finding eigenvalues. Well, this is an actual purpose for finding those eigenvalues. Down below, the next line down there at the proportion, that is the amount of variance explained within that data set by that eigenvalue. So as you see, the cumulative line goes across, adds up the proportions. So what this is telling us here is principal component one, that PC1 value there, explains 70% of the variance within that data set of these eight cost drivers. When we move to PC2, an additional 10% of that variance is explained all the way through PC8, where we go through and have 100% of the variance explained within that data set by these eight cost drivers. So now I need to take this and use it in a way that's tangible to my cost model, right? So we're looking at what are the coefficients of this and what are my input values gonna be that help me drive this factor for my regression line. Um, so the first thing that happens is we have to normalize these input parameters that I have at the top, and I'll show that stuff on the next slide. But the next thing we have to think about is we're scoring these variables on a system of one through five, um, you know, five being more complex than one. So logically, you would assume that as my score increases, my cost needs to increase as well. It needs to be that positive um, direct relationship between these two. So if we look at PC2, I've highlighted some of these numbers in red, and as you'll notice, they're all negative. So as my score would increase, it would drive my cost down. So from the cost estimating perspective, again, we're forward thinking with this methodology of how do we use it to describe the cost in future satellites. I need those values to have a positive relationship. And in this case, they don't. So I wouldn't be able to use PC2 as an input variable. So Again, looking at PC1, it's capturing the majority of the variance anyway. And the way I'd have to use these vectors is I would have to stack them. I can't just use PC2, I'd have to use PC1 and PC2. Can't just use PC3, I'd have to use PC1, 2, and 3 in my um, regression model. So with that in mind, since 
on these um, regressions that we were running, for the majority of the SIRS, PC1 had all positive coefficients there, and it's also capturing the most variance. So moving forward, we decided that would be enough to only use PC1 in our model going forward. So on this slide here, I'll get a little more in depth into that process that we look at. So my input scores, that's the score that I'm gonna be assigning to my new hypothetical proposal here. The min and the max columns, that describes within the data set for this specific SIR, the minimum and maximum values that we've assigned to each program within that data set. So what we're doing then is just, because everything is on a scale of one to five, but for example, parameter one, things were only scored between one and three. So I'm gonna normalize the score across all eight parameters in, until they're all between a zero and one. So we just, for that simple normalization, we take the input score minus the minimum divided by the maximum minus the minimum. And that's gonna give us a normalized score of zero to one for all parameters, one through eight. So then in the next column there, PC1 coefficient, if you look back to the previous slide, you'll see that this is your eigenvector for PC1, all those coefficients we saw in that table previously. And again, so this is something important that we wanted to have a process that we could replicate for the model. I can easily just grab these eight coefficients here for this linear combination out of Minitab, and then it spits out um, the scores there on the right. It's just a simple linear combination, a dot product, you could say, of these two vectors. So it's the zero, times a 0.48, the 0.25 times a 0.344. And then we add those up all the way down to get our acquisition complexity score of 0.288. So every program in the data set is gonna have its own score as well as the score of the program that I'm providing the estimate for. So once we have all those values in there, we run this through the regression again and keep PC1 as a standalone variable. So in a sense, you could think of the factor that's happening on your cost estimate would be your regression coefficient. So say put PC1 in there with size of the satellite, get my equation, my regression coefficient for PC1 was a 0.16. So I just raised that to my ACS score. And now I could say, based on the acquisition complexity of this program, my cost is gonna be increased by 12% because that factor there represents how it's reacting within the regression equation. So again, from what I mentioned before, just to touch on again, PC1 is all positive numbers here. So I know it's gonna be a direct relationship between increasing the cost or increasing the cost drivers and increasing the cost. So, we went through and did this 104 different times, one for each SIR, and out of the entire data set, we found 18 SIRs that either had a negative uh, coefficient within the overall regression model or negative coefficients for that PC1 eigenvector. So in those cases, we did not include principal components as a variable in our regression. And for the rest of those cases where it remained a variable in the SIR, we saw improvements in the R squared, you know, just your initial look at the data. That's what everybody tends to have their eyes drawn to first is R, R squared. But we were also seeing moderate reductions in standard error. The last thing that we needed to think through when we were going through this is how did the other variables react once we added principal component one into this regression line? So for example, there's a couple cases in where if I added um, PC1 into the regression, my coefficient for another variable flipped from positive to negative. So for example, maybe my size of the satellite is increasing, but that's gonna spit out a different cost now, or a lower cost now, because adding PC1 flipped that coefficient for size and power from positive to a negative. So again, in those uh, cases, we had to analyze um, how the other variables were impacted and make the decision whether or not to include ACS as an independent variable or not. And to date, so what we've done is we've actually gone through and expanded the ACS scoring here from just the overall program assignment at the top level is we've broken that down further for every single satellite. We give a different, sometimes different ACS score for those 
eight parameters between the bus, the payload, the CPM level, and both non-recurring and recurring for each of those. So six different sets of scores across every program. Um, and we, we decided that would be the right approach. For example, some programs might use the same bus as a previous program that have a brand new payload. So you don't wanna assign one score when we do all the bus and payload search separately. So we split that out um, and we've reevaluated 104 of these different serves utilizing both PC1 and PC2 just to test this out, make sure we're looking at everything. And then we've also built in sensitivity analysis to this as well. And this kind of touches back on the coefficients I talked about previously, that maybe adding PC1 takes up the majority of that SIR now and impact changing the size or the schedule or one of our other variables doesn't impact the bottom line at all. So we've added sensitivity analysis tables. But the most important thing that's coming from looking outside of Excel and our typical pattern of doing things here is we've revamped our entire database um, in and of itself so we could easily add this concept in here using principal components analysis knowing that we could not do it in Excel. So instead of having you know your traditional aerospace big business mindset is you move slow this is the way we've always done it and so knowing that we wouldn't be able to use this variable in Excel, we took the approach of, well, this means that we're gonna change everything. Instead of trying to make our solution work for what we have, we're gonna change everything we have to get this solution because we know it works and we know it's the correct way. So we've downsized a lot of our file sizes, streamlined our databases, streamlined our process for running the regressions, changed the entire interface of our cost model as a whole just so we can incorporate this. So in the end, it used to be maybe a couple months to go through and update all the serves, and now it takes a couple hours. And then this is recap if, um, so again, we added this new acquisition complexity variable to come up with an approach that is mathematically sound and repeatable. Again, it doesn't work to just look backwards at the data set and say, yeah, we could describe that data set it's repeatable because we want to use that going forward. And uh, to date, we've tested and validated 104 of our SIRS, which is a huge task when you look at that. And we've seen improvements across the model as a whole. So that ends my spiel here. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those. I think we may have distracted them uh, with the trivia question. So. <laughs> <laughs> so if uh, if anybody has any uh, questions on this presentation, um, Michael's going to be. Oh, here we go. We have a question from Sri Ram. Get you unmuted, sir. Okay, um, Sri Ram, you can speak when you like. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed your presentation. It's very interesting. I'm an engineer myself, and uh, we sell engineering software, but I was very pleased to see all the engineering things you built into this cost analysis. But the, you have a lot of nice things going on already. I was kind of curious as to why you are going to move everything from Minitab to R next, in your last point here. So the, the cost model that we have currently resides in Excel. And there's no easy way. So the issue we ran into when we first started looking at PLS for uh, PCA is you can link data from Minitab straight to Excel. What happened one day is we came in and that link broke on us and it we were not able to access that Excel file anymore. We tried 100 different ways. We looked into it and just by doing you know internet searches, we discovered that Excel was built to not work well with other software to keep you within the Microsoft Office world. So since that's where our cost model lived and our entire database was there, well, it's like, if this isn't gonna work with our, you know, um, advanced stats that we have to do on this, we need to transition out of Excel if it's gonna limit our analysis that we're able to do and the methods that we're able to utilize. So right now it's creating a lot of manual work to take results out of Minitab and put them back into Excel and then re-link that to our cost model. 
Um, and so we have a couple guys on our team now that we've hired within the last year that all they do is, you know, they're data nerds in R and that's where their expertise is. So that's the route that we're, we're going down here. We know they, they're going to be able to build us a cost, the cost model in R. And I mean, my idea with that is the cost model needs to be in R, the analysis side that goes into it. If it's a mini tab, it doesn't matter versus being in R. I'd rather pay, you know, a couple hundred thousand or hundred, couple thousand dollars to buy a software package that does this and pay someone to go rebuild everything that that software package already includes. Um, but as far as using the model and updating the model efficiently would be, it's not efficient in Excel and it leaves a lot of room for user error. So, and I found the first time that I went through and rebuilt the cost model, I linked to a couple wrong coefficients and I was getting answers out from a cost model. It's like, well, this isn't working at all. So we're gonna try to move to R to avoid the user error aspect of that. Okay, that was very helpful. Thank you. The thing with Excel, you know, uh, the errors you catch are fine. The errors you don't catch are the ones who are much more dangerous. Yeah, and with 104 serves in here, you, you don't know when you're gonna come across that error. It depends on what your in, input variable is gonna be to get a wonky number coming out of that. And so, well, then it's like, well, crap, did I do three estimates and have a wrong <laughs> formula in here? So we're, we're trying to break up with Excel as quickly as we can. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question is coming from Paige Highsmith. Paige, you are free to unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep, we sure can. Okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Matthew Ramirez. Oh, He's Danny, I'm sorry, who's, uh, who's speaking? Steve, hang on a sec, Steve. We've got, we've got a couple more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, hey, Chai Smith, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, yes, uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, uh, thank you. I really enjoyed this presentation. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask, and please forgive me if you already answered it. Um, I'm just curious. I I love the idea of breaking up with Excel. I'm on I'm on your team there. Um, what? Where are you housing your data? Because you mentioned you want to have the model in R. So are you gonna? Where are you storing your data? What kind of database are you using? Um, so again, right now everything's in Excel, but my, my teammates, Gunnar and Charles, they're trying to move that into a SQL database. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next up we have Bryce. Uh, Bryce Kastner, you're ready to go. Yeah, yeah, of course. So can you guys hear me? Sure can. Yep. All right, I just had one quick question, man. I don't mean to hold up everything, but I was just wondering, so in the transition uh, from Excel to Python and R, I mean, we've thought about that in my workplace as well, but I was just curious if you if you had ever considered just in your group, like during that transition, would you be deploying these models through a specific API or user interface, or would it be, you, you would utilize these software resources essentially, and then be exporting these back into the Excel platform? So the, the current process is um, we're on version seven of this. I'm doing version eight. So I'm doing version eight in Excel. And then that's going to be the basis for um, Charles and Gunnar to take this from Excel and move it into R. And then um, we're going to do as much in R as we can and try to, you know, not, not keep anything in Excel going forward. Our data pools, you know, from the Cognos sort of world, we are gonna have to keep those in Excel because that's how we get that report out of our um, overall Boeing data system, right? So there's always gonna be those little pieces that we can't get entirely out of Excel, but um, Inventor is a lot smarter on this part of it than I am, but you know, his mindset is we keep those, we do mapping in Excel, and then we just, from there, shoot everything over to R and don't get out of R. In my mindset too, um, like I mentioned before, the data analysis side of it, like I don't care where I get my data table from because I'm gonna take that into a software package 
and do all the stats and analysis in there that I can't do in Excel anyway. So whether my my data tab that I'm looking at is coming from Excel or R, from my perspective, it doesn't impact me as much. I just need that data where I can work with it. And as far as the data integrity goes and not mess messing with any source data accidentally, the fewer people that have access to that data, the better. And if that's an R, that means a lot of our team is not gonna mess up that database because as you know, multiple people and multiple files, things get changed accidentally and then you can't trace things anymore. So in my mind, as much as moves out of Excel, the better. Did that answer what you were asking? I'd send a rant. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, somewhat. And so like the, the last portion is so in the with the model as a whole, right? So you reduce these models to a three megabyte size, you said, and they were X megabytes before. So what would be I, I'm mainly asking from like a defense uh, standpoint, like so with security issues concerning like classification, classified programs and stuff. I'm just wondering if you guys have thought about it and if you've ran into any issues with transitioning from something like an Excel framework that's very trusted in those spaces versus developing yeah. a model through an API, say with a web interface that a customer, an external one or internal can go to and input like all of your stuff, of course, will be done in the background in Python, and then they would just see one web page that they didn't put their variables and it would boom, spit out an answer. I was just curious if you guys yeah, uh, so ventured down that path. <laughs> that's, that's on our future steps actually, because we don't even use this, the same cost model for when we do proprietary or you know um, more government heavy proposals because you need the full up BOE, right? Agreed, okay. So, yeah, okay. so this is mostly the parametric side, but yeah, that's something we're thinking about is how, how can we take these equations out of the model into a format that's, you know, your traditional TINA compliant BOE acceptable, right? Because okay. what, okay. what we have in a cost model would not pass TINA as mm -hmm. just looking from the cost model. You still have to take that data out and translate it into something to submit as part of a proposal. The beauty of it is I do all commercial satellites, so I don't have to worry about that ever. But that's on our future steps is how can we expedite that process to where we could still use a data driven parametric approach for estimating for TINA compliant BOEs. So that is, that's a step that we're working towards and that I don't see that not being in Excel for that aspect of it. But for the one off okay. like independent cost estimates that in my mind, the parametric should be primarily used for anyway, um, I see no issue with a model but yeah the uh the defense side that's that's changing everything entirely right because it's all about documentation and boes and write-ups so okay that, okay that, that you, would that, have that, to be that, the government that hit it right on that <laughs> yeah the government would have to change what their requirement requirements are for us to get out of excel for you know all that all right thank you very much man yeah thanks guys this has been a great um a great conversation um, let's see so Karen asked uh, a trivia question not too long ago and I have to say I am pleased to share the results with everyone um, two quite two the two correct two correct answers came in actually as Karen was still reading the question um, and those answers were from Christian Smart and David Berry so congratulations to you both for getting it right um, the answer being the Muppets skit from the late 70s, Pigs in Space. Uh, honorable mention going to Darren Hoffman and Paige Highsmith for guessing Lost in Space, seeing as the Pigs in Space bit was kind of a parody of Lost in Space. I think you get, you deserve a shout out. We also had another person who guessed it was the end of History of the World Part 1. If you know that, you know it. And... Um, that's a great answer too, but that wasn't the right one. <laughs> All right, well, we've got some smart people on the lines or, or, or maybe yeah. some nerdy people. Okay, uh, <laughs> a little column A, a little column B. I think all of you guys are both smart and nerdy and, and that's, that's great. All right, so now we are moving on to the next part of the program. So Steve is going to introduce Matthew, but a little bit about Steve first. So Steve Sterk is a, uh, um, he's a longtime member of ICEA. Um, he's been on the board um, for at least two years, maybe longer. Uh, he's currently on the board again, and he works at uh, NASA JPL. All right, so go ahead, Steve. 
Hey, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Karen. So I, I like to take this time to um, introduce Matthew Ramirez. <clears throat> Matthew is a systems engineer at J at Jet at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. He is currently working on a systems verification and validation for NASA's ISRO project. Matthew started his career as my summer and fall intern several years ago. He helped me obtain good R-square values for NASA's parametric X-plane cost model. After his internship at NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, he was hired at JPL. Matthew has previously experienced in cost analysis for spacecraft and payload systems and is a member of the Team X, a concurrent engineering team at JPL. He's also made contributions to the development of the NASA Instrument Cost Model, otherwise known as NICM, through software and statistical analysis. Matthew holds a BS in mathematics at St. Joseph College, Brooklyn, New York and he is currently a student at John Hopkins University pursuing a master's degree in space engineering. Some of his main hobbies and interests is competitive swimming, hiking, backpacking, and flying. Matthew is currently a student who is seeking to achieve his private pilot license. I seen him flying over uh, LA. I think he's flown 10 times. With nothing further to do, please help me join Matthew to the virtual stage. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, that was uh, quite the introduction. I'm very honored to uh, be presenting um, this ICA webinar. <clears throat> um, I'd like to first off, uh, give a small introduction on the topic of this presentation. Um, uh, so I started this uh, research um, in my graduate program and it was mostly based on the higher level programmatic um, like structure and uh, like formulation of a space-based mis uh, missile defense program. Um, and the, the point of the, the research was to think of some concepts that can be, in uh, can be put in place um, to replace the old systems. In this era of new space technology and commercialization of the space industry, we see um, a rise in different um, space vehicles, space technology that's being uh, globally produced, um, especially with newer companies like SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, Relativity Space. All of these companies have been outstanding um, and funding themselves through uh, investments and people that are pursuing capital gain rather than government contracts. Um, and this could, this is very good for our space industry, for our country, but it's also, it also imposes a security threat and the military is well aware of that because um, technology can get into the wrong hands and other countries like China, Iran, uh, North Korea can have the capability to um, launch uh, nuclear warheads or just, uh, you know, rockets that may endanger our military operations overseas. So the military invests heavily on space-based systems. Uh, this includes surveillance, communications, weather, uh, weather purposes, missile launch detection, and uh, technology that's uh, like ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, um, and other weapons have become larger threat as, as a result of the new technology being produced. So, the military requested for a modern and highly capable space missile defense system. 
Um, and our goal was to think of a formulation process and some concepts and think about a couple things, um, the capabilities, um, whether or not those designs were feasible and mostly overall how much it will cost, um, especially as focusing on, on the cost as, um, for, the, for this community as well. It, it becomes like the overarching factor um, because to be honest, we can build anything almost. And um, it's really about what, what uh, capabilities we can put in in order to stay in our budget and to complete our mission. So just a bit history, um, the current program um, called SIBRS, which is a space-based infrared system program, um, is a constellation of satellites that uses scanning infrared imaging um, to detect heat that can be emitted from ballistic missiles in the early stages of flight. And uh, its payload is is very strong, um, has, has very strong accuracy in determining um, potential launches from certain parts of the world that the, the constellation um, oversees. Um, there, there are about, I, I wanna say like 12 missions that were launched in total, um, but not all operational at the same time because of uh, spacecraft life, li uh, lifetime. Some of them ranged from three years, some of them ranged from five years, depending on the different technology used. And these warning systems are being sent from the constellation to ground systems um, to give um, a, a, a threat a, like notice that a rocket or some weapon is being launched um, and appropriate actions can be taken um, from that. The first satellite launched in 2011, and the program continues to launch satellites until probably around 2026. Um, I know that the next uh, Sibir's satellite will be launched next year, um, and hopefully the Sibir's program can uh, be operated efficiently by a, a transitioning to the Space Force um, to continue this program efficiently until a new one can be uh, formulated. <clears throat> so there was a new concept that was proposed um, in January of 2019, uh, the Trump administration announced that the Pentagon would be undertaking a near-term examination of concepts and technology for space-based defenses. Uh, since then, um, the MDA decided to create or release a certain contractor uh, proposal or offerings to, to do research on new concepts. And one of the concepts that was uh, uh, proposed was to have a space-based interceptor. Now this sounds very complex. It's definitely something we've never done, and it raises a lot of uh, a lot of questions. Um, it, 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 the mil military defense um, um, like problems that uh, th that they that they explored or tried to resolve um, came with a lot of uh, a lot of questions in terms of its legal, political, fis uh, fiscal, and technological advancements that they've made uh, to propose such a program. Um, and some of the capabilities um, that included are uh, satellite constellations carrying a payload of infrared sensors uh, or terrestrial sen uh, radars that can detect, detect those missile launches. Um, provide precise tracking and trajectory information. And uh, probably one of the uh, coolest um, uh, capabilities was the ability to intercept missiles by having an intercepting spacecraft deorbit from a uh, deorbit and maneuver towards the missile using its own sensors to make contact with a projectile. Uh, furthermore, I didn't list it here, but um, they also even explored a way to detect or assess whether or not there was a missile that could potentially be a decoy um, before it actually launched the weapon uh, to its target. Um, and all of these sound costly just, just by listing those capabilities. Uh, they sound 
uh, like very difficult uh, engineering um, processes that would would need to be incorporated in order to carry out such a mission. And as a result, uh, Congress pushed back on this concept because there was no heritage design. There wasn't enough uh, cost. There, there wasn't a, a suitable cost for uh, being uh, to, to have introduced into the, um, the 2020 fiscal year budget. Um, and as a result, they didn't allocate enough funding towards the budget for continuing research and development. Um, and putting interceptors in space generally has become a controversial topic from technologically feasibility and cost stance standpoint. So after um, in 2020, or early 2021 in January, um, they, uh, Congress proposed to have additional funding to the Missile, missile Defense uh, System uh, Association. Um, to study or research uh, a different concept. And one of the capabilities that they definitely need to, uh, to have in replacement of the old uh, CBRS, um mission program uh, was to have one tracking and discriminating ballistic missiles and one for tracking hypersonic missiles. And when you're proposing this kind of uh, satellite constellation, there's a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of capabilities you might want to consider. You might want to consider the types of payload that your spacecraft will want to carry and operate with, depending on the location, uh, the, the the maybe the type of orbit um, your spacecraft will operate in, and the lifetime and the number of spacecraft. So um, as, as a graduate student at Johns Hopkins uh, Space Systems Engineering Program, we developed two separate concepts um, where we had a case study to assess some of the de design features and costs for a constellation system to track ballistic missiles. Uh, we compared results to historical examples um, and talked about a lot of the differences within our concept and other concepts, as well as uh, spacecraft designs from science programs uh, that are Earth orbiting, or even military spacecraft used for communications and weather. We had to determine the number of satellites needed to populate a constellation system for that satellite concept, and determine the cost to fully populate the satellite constellation. Now, so the purpose of this presentation is not necessarily to delve to, to delve in the technical aspects of the project, but the overarching programmatic aspects of formulating such a design. And the reason this is important is because you might not be you might not be seeing the entire complexity of the program or the 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 main technical aspects of your spacecraft system if all you do is focus into too too far into the weeds with data and in order to assess properly what kind of payload you you need to have for a certain capability and how much it's going to cost from a realistic standpoint of 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 seeing the main aspects of your mission then you can over, you can have an overarching ass assessment that can probably have a stronger impact when proposing to Congress or NASA to the military to have a mission in, 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 that has this capability. And there are some things that you would consider um, from a technological standpoint, you need a radar payload and an infrared scanner. Um, and these sensors are have some sort of a level of accuracy that needs to meet for those requirements and has um, th they have to have some sort of robustness. So our initial research, um, uh, we used aperture diameter um, to determine the cost or the total cost um, of the spacecraft payload and compared it to other data points, 
as you can see in this graph from other missions. And we put those in those data points into bounds of confidence intervals and predicted intervals to assess the total cost versus ap uh, aperture diameter. And uh, the value seems to uh, seem to be reasonable based on that historical data. Um, and it, it, it normally is if you have bounds within your data points and you're not extrapolating, which in this case we did not. The range, uh, not to confuse with the range in which the radar will um, operate from uh, from the Earth, it's actually the range between or the coverage of the radar and the GPS um, instruments, but it's also the distance between or the, the diameter in which half of it would be the radius between each constellation. So the aperture diameter to, to achieve the signal to noise ratio was around three, and that's, that's within the range of 10,300 kilometers. So it fits within the military's requirements and uh, for the satellite requirements, and the payload cost of those instruments fit within the um, the, the budget in which you would have constraints with for such a concept. This uh, produced a cost of 750 million per satellite, and we determined that we can afford to have 32 different satellites, which would essentially be the same satellites, just replicas to cover the distance in which we need those to operate in. Now in concept two, um, this will only have a cost estimate only because we figured that it was not feasible um, right, right off the bat. And the reason why I include this one is because uh, I wanted to show how much different it is to change uh, an aperture diameter um, and the range and how much it influences cost. So here we used an aperture diameter of 2.4 meters, which is massive for something of this, uh, for something in which you need to produce 32 satellites of. Um, as, as an example, Hubble's, uh, the Hubble telescope used a 2.4 meter uh, aperture for its telescope. Um, firstly, we explored maybe launching such a thing would just require some satellites, maybe like 10. But the problem is you still can't get um, an, an aperture that is large enough uh, to cover the, 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 the field of view in which it needs to operate in. And the range required to be 17,800 kilometers. Um, so it was just not seem as feasible um, with the resulting cost of almost a billion dollars uh, per satellite. So um, we, we d uh, decided not to move on with this concept. Now, another thing you have to consider is the development timeline. Um, and this is mostly an estimation. Um, so for this concept, uh, we compared our um, phase allocations for development to Landsat. Uh, Landsat was a, um, well, first of all, it's like one of the longest running uh, satellite imagery spacecraft that NASA has put out um, in the Earth's resources technology um, like uh, studies. And it essentially used um, high spectral bands or spectral resolutions to um, observe uh, geological forestry and regional planning uh, changes within the Earth. Um, and it, it, it was, it conducted a lot of science research um, uh, throughout its time and it was deemed that uh, this spacecraft had similar capabilities to what we needed to uh, have for our military purposes. Um, so in, in this chart we're trying to show the allocations for our schedule allocations for each development phase. Phase A being the formulation part which was around 25 percent of your schedule allocation 14 months. Um, phase B was 19, just almost about uh, the same as Landsat's um, schedule time. And then CD during its development phase, which were the longest parts, um, were, 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 were deemed to be a pretty accurate 
for a satellite of its kind and its size. And one thing that we had to consider was how long it would take to develop, integrate, and test these satellites if you're going to develop multiple uh, satellites at a time. So then we began to question if it takes around 73 months from A through D to develop one, can we develop multiple satellites at the same time? And how many of those, if, if so? And how many satellites can we do at that same time to where we have to start beginning to space out the amount produced just so that the lifetime or the capability of the, uh, the satellites while it's launched can, can be replaced. Um, so that's when uh, we go to the next slide. Oh, um, actually it was, it's going to be the slide after. Um, you can go to the next slide, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I, 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 I began the next topic um, a lot earlier than I thought it was going to be. One more? Yeah, one more. So <clears throat> if, if you're going to have to launch multiple satellites at a time and have all a certain amount operational at some time to have a field of view and the op operations as needed, um, we would have to adjust its design and have a sort of like a concept in which the cost effectiveness um, would be optimal for operating all those satellites at that same time. So we made an assessment. Um, we assumed 350 million per uh, cost per satellite through A through D. This included ground launch and operations. Uh, I mean, did not include like, ground launch and operations. And um, this uh, estimated cost per phase based on this co cost expended curve um, shows the cumulative percentage life cycle cost against time. As you can see, each phase um, has different uh, cost allocations and um, it, it shows that about in like phase C is about 35%, phase D was about 50% of the cost. So you'll mostly be spending most of your cost in development of the spacecraft. But what you can get from here is how much cost can design, uh, well, cost to change design direction um, can change as, uh, as you go through your uh, different milestones. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the part where I was, uh, was about to talk about. If you're designing 32 car satellites, you have multiple technical issues. The first one being your satellites, um, your satellites degradation of its subsystems. So the obvious ones are power and propellant. You have limited resources to operate them. And if you have requirements of focusing in a certain regions of Earth and always having 24-7 coverage using your radars and payload instruments from your satellites, then you need to figure out what, how many satellites you need to produce and launch at the same time, and then have other satellites in production so that when those satellites are no longer operational, they can be replaced immediately. So this became very difficult um, a, a difficult part of, uh, of this concept study um, because immediately your costs will go up if you're producing too many uh, or too little satellites because you have things to consider like solar panel degradation, which may be in, in Earth, in operating Earth environment, um, it, they can last for like seven years probably. And depending on your satellite, uh, like design. And if if you're going to make it last longer, you're going to have more satellites, more mass. You're probably going to need more launch vehicles to launch at the same time. You're going to have logistical problems where you don't have enough facilities, you don't have enough engineers, technicians 
in order to have all those satellites launching at the same time. So you have to think of a cost-effective way and an optimal way to launch and replace throughout their design life, regardless of their condition. Facilities can accommodate building eight satellites near simultaneous in this cost um, in this uh, concept study, and the total cost to populate the constellation was about twenty-four billion dollars. The cost of keeping this constellation healthy for twenty years, once the initial constellation is established, is forty-two billion dollars, reaching a total cost of sixty-six billion. In this graph, you see how often the satellites are being replaced and launched throughout the phases. And uh, there's the constellation forming phase and 20 year maintenance that you have to account for. So this was one of the complexities of this uh, sort of concept. Um, and uh, it's, it's not really a, um, it's, it's not really something that um, a lot of projects see because they don't launch that many um, spacecraft at one time or have requirements as strict as these. Um, so it was an interesting take on the, this, this research. Hey, Matthew, let me interrupt for a minute. This is Karen Morikas. Um, yeah. We are running a little bit tight on time. So if you could wrap it up in the next sure. five minutes, that would be great. Thanks. Sure, no problem. Uh, this is actually the last slide. Uh, we, can actually, uh, skip to, we can actually skip this slide. I, that's, this was fine. Um, just some adjustment options for con the concept one. Um, in order to make it more feasible, um, we had to we considered some satellite development adjustments where maybe the manufacturing rate and launch rate of satellites could decrease uh, the number of satellites that may be replaced to maintain the constellation. Uh, we considered maybe 24 instead of 32. That would save about $16 billion. Um, and then extending the design life uh, satellite lifespan of uh, by 10 to 12 years. Um, although that can make for a more costly satellite, um, 16 satellites would not need to be added, saving about $10.7 billion. So that's one consideration. Uh, you can have a more expensive satellite, but you wouldn't need to launch 16 of them, um, which would be a higher cost saving than um, you know, having a cheaper design, which is cheaper life or uh, shorter lifespan. And then I believe this one more um, slide. Um, ma manufacturing efficiency, the cost of manufacturing multiple satellites should decrease with each satellite dras drastically impacting the total cost. Um, this can have uh, more satellites be built in tandem. Um, you can explore payload parameters adjustments, such as the camera, exposure, focal length, um, the target, um, for example, increasing the target area. Um, you can have 32 satellites um, reduced down to 16 if your target area is expanded. Increased the payload cost, but saves you money on the number of satellites you'll have to build. Um, increasing source temperature and exposure time. Um, so all, all of these technical factors can be considered to reduce the number of satellites you'd want in your constellation, um, as well as uh, at the same time, keeping your requirements within bounds. And I believe that's uh, the end of, yes. And then there's references to that talks about all of um, these missions and cost considerations and, um, in the back and backup of these slides. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Matthew. That was very interesting. Um, we probably have time for one quick question, if there are any. Sure. We have, oh, yeah, we haven't gotten any yet. So you guys put your thinking caps on um, and we can always, of course, call Matthew back if um, some more questions come in. OK, thank you very much. All right. And given the fact that we are running a little bit um, uh, a little bit late in the agenda. Um, why don't we just move on? And I think we can go to, it's a couple of slides from now. Um, keep going. Yep, just one sec. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll start with the, we'll, we'll move on to the machine learning working group. Um, and so Hank, um, Hank Apgar is going to introduce this team and just a little bit about Hank. 
He is a longtime member of ICEA and ISPA and you know all the predecessors. Um, in fact, I think he was one of the founding members of, it might have been ISPA. Um, so he's been around for a long time, um, but we're happy to have him on the board. Um, and so Hank, you can take it away and introduce the folks from the Machine Learning Working Group. Yes, this is Hank. I'm speaking to you from behind the curtain. And Karen, if you could just advance one slide that shows a photograph of each of the five members of the steering group, I can introduce them individually. Uh, there they are. Well, the first member shown here of the, of the steering committee, Dr. Uh, Christian Smart, he, he earned his PhD in applied mathematics has more than 20 years of experience in predictive analytics, machine learning, and risk management. He recently published his first book, uh, Solving for Project Risk Management, uh, Understanding the Critical Role of Uncertainty in Project Management. Uh, next on the chart, photograph of Karen Marikas. Uh, Karen is a technical fellow at the Boeing Company specializing in technical affordability analysis. She has degrees in applied math and operations research engineering, lifetime member of IKEA. She was the recipient in 2018 of the IKEA Technical Achievement of the Year Award. And most recently, we note her as president of our Southern California chapter. Next is Brian Anderson. Uh, Brian is a consultant with Kobuk Consulting, where he performs operations research and software engineering, mostly for the FAA. Brian has a BA in economics and mathematics and a graduate degree in industrial and systems engineering. Uh, Dan Harper, uh, uh, has been certified as a cost estimator analyst by IKEA, and he has over 25 years of professional experience in leadership. He has a finance degree and a technology management uh, a graduate degree. Dan is very active in IKEA. Uh, next is Adam James, who is a senior analyst at Technomics, where he supports NAVSIA, TACCOM, DHS, and OSD. Adam was uh, the 2016 Technical Achievement Award given by IKEA, and since then has won two Best Paper Awards, uh, both in uh, 2019. His degree is in statistics and another degree in mathematics. So that is our esteemed uh, uh, steering committee of the machine learning for cost analysis working group. I'll turn podium over to them. All right. Well, thank you, Hank. Um, I will turn my camera back on. So actually, if you go back to the previous slide, um, I just want to sh um, just remind people that, or, or let people know that when the machine learning working group first um, came into existence, it was about a year and a half ago. Um, and we had certain objectives, which was basically to uh, create a community of interest um, and to help one another learn about machine learning, regardless of the level of knowledge that you had about it. Um, the, regardless of, you know, if you were an ICA member or not, or where you were from. Uh, the idea was just to help the community learn and grow from one another. And in particular, not just machine learning in general, but machine learning for cost analysis. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And I want to review a little bit about what we said in our very first kickoff meeting. And that was, um, hey, these are some of the things that we're, we're thinking about doing. And, and anything that has a green check mark means we've been doing that. So, you know, we've been sharing um, articles and um, 
there have been several talks at ICEA at the annual workshops or at the machine learning working group. Um, and um, we've been, you know, trying to share lessons learned, talk about what individual members have been doing with respect to machine learning. And th let me back up a little bit. Um, after we we initiated the group and we called it the machine learning for cost analysis working group, we realized it's not just limited to machine learning. Uh, it's more like machine learning and advanced analytics for cost analysis. So we are considering things such as, you know, like finding data and you know scraping data from the web and normalizing it and, and automating it and doing things like that. Um, so th there's a little bit more than just it's not just focused on machine learning. Um, the two items there that have the yellow check marks, those are in progress. And um, the, the first one there, Dan Harper will be talking about in, in a couple of slides. And the last one about developing training classes related to machine learning, that was specific, that was originally supposed to be done for the workshop in San Antonio, which did not happen. I know there are plans to continue that development and offer the, them at some point this year. So again, we'll hear a little bit more about that later. So the next slide. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to some of the other uh, members of the steering committee. And I think, uh, Brian, were you going to talk about the kind of the focus areas for our future? Yeah. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Well, I am Brian Anderson. Thanks for uh, letting me uh, chat. Well, and um, the first thing we, um, we wanted to do is uh, how do we break down what we do and help uh, kind of focus it or how do we create content that's useful for all the various uh, kind of people and uh, in our community. <laughs> so the first one we kind of identified was uh, just having general awareness of what some of these machine learning ideas are out there or what are some of the uh, more advanced topics or, or tools that people are using just to start turning that information for everybody. Um, Another uh, key group that we kind of identified was uh, developers. So folks that are really kind of getting in the weeds and um, implementing some of these algorithms or hooking up data sets and tools and services and all this other stuff. So uh, they, they sometimes encounter some unique problems and sharing how we solve them uh, that would be useful. <coughs> Excuse me. And a uh, third group we, had, we kind of found was uh, not so much the people implementing these uh, tools and um, processes, but uh, people actually use them to take data and turn into knowledge. So uh, those are kind of our three main roles that we kind of identified and hope that kind of great um, content for. So now, and I think the next one is uh, Christian. Are you on the call? Can you take the next point? People here. Brian, why don't you try muting yourself for a second? Christian, go ahead. Nope, you're still muted. Yeah, you're. Um, you're unmuted on my side. I don't know what's going on. How about now? There you go. Okay. There's a little button on my headset that uh, push it, it mutes me. So it's kind of convenient and inconvenient at the same time. So the training to develop the machine learning and advanced analytics training. We back in 2019, we were going to revamp the training and, you know, break break it down into um, CBOC and then advanced training. And then also with the development of the software cost, I think by knowledge also offer that as a separate track. But now with uh, with COVID, we haven't had a workshop in a couple of years. We're not, we're not gonna offer that this year. We are still working on, I'm planning to try to do some webinars on some of these things. We've done an intro to machine learning methods with a focus on cost analysis as part of the QED webinars and then 
you know, working on trying to set up some others. And then eventually, once we get back together, hopefully next year in uh, Pittsburgh, we'll have a fuller slate and have have some of this uh, machine learning and advanced analytics training and that is, as part of the practitioner uh, track in training at the workshop. And that's all I have. All right. So we were going to have Dan Harper talk a little bit about the communication. We're hoping he lost. <laughs> okay, so this is sort of a, a pun. We were going to have him talk about communication, but he lost his communication to the meeting. Uh, I'll, we'll skip this to see if he has a chance to get back on. Um, and so we'll go to number four, and I believe that's Adam who's going to talk about that. Yeah, it is. Thanks. Are everyone able to hear me? Yes. Perfect. So um, collaboration opportunity, that, that bullet kind of reads as yes, please. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we've talked to some other groups. We've reached out to everyone between like uh, chapters, uh, Washington area, Dayton, uh, Detroit, all of the data analytics working groups. So we're more than happy to talk to any, any of these other working groups and see how we can um, work together with all of this. Um, SCAF, AI, ML, big data, uh, focus things there. Moore's has a lot going on. They have things that are very not cost related in the data science, AI, and um, machine learning fronts, but then also things that are very cost analysis related with the, uh, with the cost cop over there. So I think point being, um, it's not like a closed group. Uh, we really want to, um, leverage what other communities are doing, collaborate, take advantage of that, and, and really move this through um, something that can help everyone. And I'll, I'll be short and brief as it's already after 3.30 here, so I don't know if anyone else has something to tag in there, but that's it for collaboration. All right, thanks, Adam. I'm not sure we've got Dan back yet, so I will cover this real quick. So right now what we're doing for the communication is uh, using a form, uh, a platform called CostFax, which is from MITRE. Um, if you are not part of the community and want to start receiving any emails or in posts uh, about, hey, this is a good link or a good article to read, um, let us know. Um, you'll see our information is in this deck, um, our contact information is in this deck. And if you move to the next slide, this one and the, the next slide are some of the resources that we've compiled. So they are available via cost facts. Um, so you can go on to the next slide as well. I'm not going to go through these, but just to give you an idea of some of the information that we are collecting in terms of resources um, and trying to make it easier for people to get started. And I think uh, the next slide just tells you who, again, who we are, what our contact information is. And um, we, so we are still at the kind of forming stages of this working group. And we definitely want to get more involvement, um, have more people involved and more participation. So, you know, think of that, Uncle Sam poster pointing his finger at you, you know, we want you to get involved with this machine learning working group. Um, and especially if you have ideas about things that you want to do, uh, whether you are brand new to machine learning and you just want to, you know, learn a little bit more about it, or whether you have been, you know, working in this area for a couple of years now or longer and you want to, you know, try some new type of algorithm or some platform, um, you know, let us know because we are looking for ideas and we're looking for help uh, moving this forward. And with that, I know we are over time, but if folks have a chance to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes, we do have some polls. We'd like to um, get your feedback. Um, Megan, did you want to talk sure. about this? Just give me, I'll, I'll stall while I'm um, getting that together. Hang on one moment. Um, so this, uh, we're gonna be using Poll EV, which is a, a surveying tool that I'm pulling up as I talk. Here we are. 
Right, and you can go to that link either on, on your computer, on your phone, tablet, whatever you have. Yes, so this is a, a word cloud uh, question. And um, if you have a multi a multi word answer, do hyphenate it because otherwise we're going to have a whole lot of those as um, as answers. Um, but what do you think of when you hear the word ICEA? And what does ICEA mean to you? What's it What's it like? Or what does being an ICEA member mean to you? So again, that link is at the top of the screen there. Ah, uh, so yes. Polev.com slash forward slash Megan Jones 104. Nice. Two for certifications, love to hear that. Um, those of you who are, aren't are certified, get on the bus. Um, the certification program is a really great way to show your boss, your future boss, um, and just to, and to maybe rub it into your past boss about how much you know about the about what it is you do. Cool. Engineering. Outstanding. Community of practice. That's a great one. <laughs> the, yes, we all say nerdy with love as a, as a uh, a full-on nerd myself, but a different type of nerd than, than some of you, I'm sure. Um, I can, that's nice. What else we got here? All right, we'll keep this up for about another 10 seconds. So if you have All right. another term, go ahead and type it in, and then we'll move on to the next question. Yeah. And do you know why some of the words are larger than others? Is that because... It's Those are more than ones. That's correct. If uh, the more people who say the, the same word, the bigger the word gets. All right. Looks like it's slowing down. All right. So why don't we move on to the next question? All right, this is another word cloud and another uh, another one where you should hyphenate your answers if you want them to stay together. Um, what topics are you interested in for future webinars? <laughs> and this is not uncertainty as in I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know what type of topics I would like to see. There we go. Production system analysis. That's a new combination of words I've not seen you guys say. That's a good one. Oh, and, and maybe I was wrong. We don't need uh, the hyphens for this one. Oh, that's right. You guys could, this is the one where you guys can vote for each other's answers. Um, sorry, we're, this is, this is our test drive of this uh, poll EV as well. So thank you also for participating in today's test of our interactive polling software. Cool. Ooh. All right, well, we've got um, we've got nine votes so far for those top three. I think this will give you guys some. Uh, oh, hello. We'll give you guys a, a nice little guide into the you know, direction into the future. Oh, here we go. We're gonna have to break that uh, top answer down a little, I think. Although if you are interested in uh, webinars about or additional information about the tools 
Um, the cost estimating tools that are available. ICEA does have a program uh, we call the Tech Showcase, and there's a link to that on the, the front of the ICEA, the top of the ICEA homepage. Um, this is where this is where the the software companies and and the the people who make those tools get to to show off, show their stuff and and show us how their tools work with demos and and um, a little more promotional kind of kinds of webinars. So if there is a tool that you know if you're looking for info on some tools, check that page out because um, there's some there's some some resources there for you as well. Those of you who've been around for more than six years might remember that we used to have a thing called the tools track at the workshop. Um, and it was a complicated kind of thing to do because everybody, there were people who wanted to see the tools track, but they didn't want to not see one of the educational papers to go to it. So we, we moved those over to a webinar uh, format a couple years ago. Um, and we've got webinars currently. We actually have one coming up from the folks at Palisade. Um, we've got a history, some webinars going back from Price. We've got um, at least one, a couple from ACIT. Um, I know we have one from a couple years ago from Booz Allen. And there's more. I don't remember them all off the top of my head. All right. Well, why don't that's the input seem to be slowing down here. So why don't we move on to the next one? Okay. Ah, it's another one. This is a, a vote. Um, just just click your answers, the ones that you want to see. I think we've limited you to clicking three, although I hope I didn't mess that up. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Mm. Poll is full. Okay, so uh, I guess I did mess that up. Um, but we got a pretty good we got a pretty good uh, spread here. It, um, it we're I think it's showing at least what the top five are. All right, so Karen, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question because this one That's has good. filled out. So what is it you're hoping to learn from the machine learning and advancing analytics for cost analysts and analysis? I hope I didn't. Hmm. <laughs> Nobody's particularly interested in selling it to their coworkers. So that's, that's just <laughs> <not>. <laughs> I've, I got enough things I got to tell them about. I don't need to tell them about that. Um, cool. So how you can use it, I guess, imagine how you ha imagine it's also going to be how, how you can use it to make your work better. Um, that seems like a pretty universal, universal desire for what we would be using that for. Um, and thanks again. I'm sorry about the poll is full. I didn't know that was a thing. Uh, this is this is how we learn. Yes, this is the first time we've done the poll EV in one of these webinars. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, machine learning people, what is your primary function? Explain explain your function. Uh, <laughs> there is. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, we didn't uh, fix that one. Gosh, look at this cur this curtain head. This curtain has just fallen apart, and you guys are seeing all the mess behind the backstage. But uh, uh, <laughs> I just stick it with this. <laughs> so um, I think was that one. Was that the last one, or is there one more? I think there was one more, but we can skip it. Um, because we are over time and we wanted to get to the kind of recognition. Um, and then we do have uh, two announcements. So if you're able to share, I think it's slide 37, mm -hmm. um, just a couple of 
um, events that are coming up at ICEA. The first one, uh, oh, Megan, did you want to talk about these? I'd be delighted to. Um, although I think I'll leave the first one to you. Uh, I'll do I'll do the workshop. You talk about the COG. Okay. All right. The ICEA OEM COG, Original Equipment Manufacturers Cooperative Opportunities Group. So this is an industry group of original equipment manufacturers. Uh, we've had, you can see some of the, the groups or companies that we've had um, as part of, I'll say, the, the working group or the steering committee. Uh, and our next event is about two weeks from today. And we're going to be talking about affordability analysis and what it means to the, the OEMs. And it could be a specific, uh, I'll say, function or organization within an OEM. So we hope you attend that. And the next one, Megan? Uh, the, the next one's the big one. It's the online workshops. First time we've ever really done uh, the, the, the big show as an online event. Uh, that's going to be May 17th through 20th. Uh, it, we made a bunch of changes to the schedule and how everything's going to work for this year because of how everything has changed and nothing is the way it used to be. Um, instead of doing full days, we're going to be doing half days. Um, and we, we chose the timing of those half days so that it's morning in California, afternoon on the East Coast, and evening, but not too terrible if you're in the UK or Europe. Uh, sorry, most of Asia, we, there's really no time we can get for the entire planet. But the cool thing is that because it's an online event, we're going to be recording all of the sessions. And for those of you who sign up and register to come, you will have six months to log back on to the site for the, for the workshop and watch all the presentations at your leisure, um, which even though um, there are fewer sessions this year, unlike when you're there in person, you when when we're, when we're back in uh, we're we're back at in-person conferences, you can only be in one place at one time. Uh, but when now we have an online workshop, you can actually really watch everything. Um, there was an uh, there was another really good point about it, but uh, anyway, go on over to. I see online.com slash online 2021. There's a bunch of information um, how you can sign up. Ah, there are still some folks who have, we still have a few to go. Um, for the first 250 people who sign up, that's 200 American addresses and the first 50 addresses outside the US, we're going to send you a goodie box. That sort of stuff that you would usually troll the exhibit hall and pick up a stress ball here, a post-it bo post note set there. Um, this was an idea that the workshop committee came up with, and I love it. It's it's a really, you know, we, we've had so much not normal happening over the past year. It's going to, we're going to send you a little something to help it feel a little more normal. And who doesn't love getting care packages in the mail? And if, and if you're a stick in the mud who doesn't like getting care packages in the mail, you can just decline when you sign up. So, yeah, we hope, we hope to virtually see all of you there. Um, we're, we're putting together a pretty good show. It's it's really starting to, to, to ramp up in the prep, preparation time. And uh, I think it's gonna be a good one. Okay, and so let's go to the next slide, which is our sort of closing and recognition. And Melissa Winter is going to be doing the, the recognition. And for those of you who don't know Melissa, she's been on the, the SoCal board for at least four years, maybe longer. She's currently the treasurer and she is an expert in price, uh, but is now working at Northrop Grumman. All right, go ahead, Melissa. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I think this is my fourth term on the SoCal board. So I'm going in my seventh year here. So Loving it. Um, <laughs> so we just wanted to uh, say a special thank you to all the presenters, to Mike Finnegan, Matt Ramirez, and the whole um, machine learning steering committee, Dan, Brian, Adam, Christian, and Karen, and also to the trivia winners, David, Barry, and Christian again. So I would like to present you with this token of our appreciation, um, the, I, the new ICS SoCal coin. And you know, we designed this last year for those of you who are following along. Some of you may have submitted um, design ideas, but this is the one that we ended up with. So we will be sending you all these coins. So thank you so much for joining us and um, putting on a great presentation. All right, okay. And thank you, Melissa. And so that brings us to the very end 
just want to thank you all for attending. Um, I believe a, a survey is going to be coming out right after this. Um, but more importantly, see these yellow stars on the screen. Um, make sure that you know if you want to present at one of these webinars or at our all our all day in person workshop when we start doing them again, uh, let us know. Um, or if you want to get more involved with the chapter or with the machine learning working group in any way, let us know. Um, the next slide, which we don't have to go to, has all of the contact information for the SoCal board. Um, and the previous slide, a couple up, had the information for the machine learning steering committee. All right, and with that, Megan, I will turn it back to you. Sorry, I was muted. No, muted, no need to turn it back to me. This is your, yours, yours to adjourn, but thank you guys. Thank you both to the Southern California chapter and to the Machine Learning Working Group for, for putting on a great show. You guys always, you guys always come out and, and, and bring it with the content. So it's, it's a real, it's a real pleasure and, and you guys are a real asset to the entire association folks. So thank you all Southern California and thank you all you machine learners. All right, I'm glad you were able to join us. And now you understand what machine learning in space is all about. Um, and we will see you, if not in May, hopefully at the next Southern California workshop. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.